I'm going to let it in. And thank you again so much. Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. We appreciate you being with us today, and we very appreciate our speaker, Dr. Andrew Duxbury, who is in the midst of clinic and uh, has put you know a, a good bit of thought into this uh, topic, which is determining competency and capacity. Some of you who've been with us before know that we like to take our topics from your suggestions, you who are watching this now. Uh, and this was such a topic. It was suggested by a former attendee, and I asked Dr. Duxbury if he would mind doing it, and he did not, which I very much appreciate, and appreciate you being here. Um, so I know that those of you who are here with us are probably terribly interested in this topic and others, and I appreciate that. We are accredited by the Alabama Board of Nursing and also by the Alabama Board of Social Work to provide 1.0 contact hour for this course. To receive credit, you must do the evaluation, and the evaluation is password protected. The uh, link to that evaluation, for those of you who are participating by phone or otherwise unable to see a screen, maybe watching, uh, watching by phone, I'll give you the evaluation link if you're ready. Uh, and again, it's password protected. The link today is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters six g as in girl p as in paul three v as in victory k z as in zoo that is our link. I'll be giving out the password at the end of the hour. And by doing this in this way, social workers on the call are able to list this as a live or face-to-face -face or course versus a recorded meeting. So please make note of that when you're turning in your hours. Everyone receives a certificate and nurses, we will be posting your hours uh, for you within the week with the Alabama Board of Nursing. Again, the evaluation is password protected uh, and we will give it out at the end of today. Uh, care Patrol, for those of you who aren't aware, is an aging care resource or navigation company. And some people know us as a placement agency. We help people understand what's next in their healthcare journey and who the providers are in that space, how those are paid and what to expect and then if we match to certain providers, those that only accept private pay, we're also paid. That's how we earn a living. And we very much appreciate your referrals, which have greatly impacted our business and for which I am most appreciative. Uh, again, our topic today is determining competency and capacity. And our speaker, uh, who I consider now a friend, is Dr. Andrew Duxbury who is both my mother's primary care physician in the geriatric clinic at UAB and also a professor with the School of Medicine, a division of gerontology, geriatrics, and palliative care. And I know that many of you on the call know Dr. Duxbury. You know him to be an excellent educator. It is no doubt his mission and passion in life or uh, else I think he wouldn't be doing these, these for us. Uh, because he gets nothing from it. It's just a nicety, and I appreciate that from him. And with that, I'll cede the floor to you, Dr. Duxbury. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's always fun to be able to share and improve the knowledge base of people interested in elder care in any way. Um, when I was asked to do this, I was asked to talk about competency and capacity, and uh, the most important thing to understand with this is we throw these two words around a lot, 
without giving a lot of thought as to what they actually mean. And they have some very specific definitions that we have to be aware of. Next slide. And the first thing to think about is how does somebody become incompetent or incapacitated? In some cases, it's a very sudden thing. Somebody has a very serious illness or injury, there's a car accident, they have a head injury, and all of a sudden their central nervous system does not work and they were just fine, you know, moments before. Um, everybody understands those kinds of situations and that somebody in and help with decision making at that point. What's much more difficult and much more common in geriatric care are the gradual processes that change how somebody is able to function in life. And these can be a cognitive issue like any one of the dementing illnesses. It can be the worsening of psychiatric disease. Depression, for instance, which is endemic in older populations can lead to changes in capacity for making decisions. Or it can be a mix of a physical disability with a, a cognitive problem of some part that leads to the individual not being able to fulfill a particular role in terms of their uh, living situation. We have all made choices as adults to create our own lives and we fit within that life. And much of geriatric medicine is about teasing out when somebody no longer fits properly into the life that they designed. Uh, something has happened so that pieces of what was previously functional are now not functional and are cause, causing issues to arise that would not have arisen in a younger individual or in a more functional individual. Next slide. The most common cause of uh, lack of capacity in an aging adult, of course, is a, dement uh, a dementing illness. The vast majority of dementias are insidious. They happen slowly. If we take a look at the typical course of Alzheimer's disease, for instance, there is usually a gap of roughly seven years between the first noted sign or symptom and the actual diagnosis being made. And there can be another seven to 10 years from the time of diagnosis to the time of death, assuming there are not other physiologic problems going on. So it is a disease with an arc of 15 to 20 years of duration. This means it's moving very, very, very slowly. And this means that uh, people often who are intimately involved with an individual with a dementing process like Alzheimer's don't see it. The changes are too slow. Spouses just start automatically picking up the slack because the dyad has been functioning together as a unit for decades. Or it takes some sort of unrelated external event to open a family's eyes. Something along the lines of, you know, mom was just fine and then the cat died. Well, the cat's death, of course, had absolutely nothing to do with mom's developing dementia, but it became a convenient marker for that particular family to have noticed a difference in function and to have changed their thinking about who the individual is. Usually in a family, the spouse or a child that lives nearby is less likely to notice to decline in function and capacity than a child who lives at distance because the child who lives at distance does not see that individual anywhere near as frequently. They may not come home for several years. So when they do come home, because they haven't seen things for several years, they have a much larger delta and they're thinking back 
to what was happening two years ago, and they can see a change that has happened over that length of time, whereas the people involved on a day-to-day -day basis, the change is so small day-to-day, -day, they haven't been able to see it. It's like the old story of the frog in the boiling pot of water, where the temperature of the water is raised so slowly that the frog never notices the difference. Next slide. Different dementias have very different arcs in terms of how they present. If we look at the axis of function over, over against time, um, Alzheimer's disease tends to follow a curve of decline, steady decline over time. It's usually not that nice straight line. It's usually more of an arc, but you know, I'm not very good with the, uh, the graphic piece of my computer, so I had to do it that way. Ischemic vascular disease, which is dementia caused by stroke, usually the people are at a certain level. Stroke damages the brain in some way. There is a decline, they even out again, and then there's another stroke, and then they even out, and then another stroke, and it goes down in more of a stair-step pattern. Frontal lobe dementia, which is another very common dementia, tends to strike people relatively early in their elderhood. Uh, it often shows up in the 60s or early 70s, whereas Alzheimer's is much more a disease of the 80s and 90s. And these people tend to have a very rapid drop in function and capacity. And then they kind of even out and the decline after that becomes much, much more slow. They, they are relatively stable for a number of years. Next slide, please. Okay. So how, and one of the things that I always like to throw out to people is to think about how as a society, should we deal with dementia? In some ways, dementia is probably an inevitable consequence of the very powerful brains that we have been given, that the organic processes that allow our brains to be so fantastic in our younger life, when allowed to continue on for decade after decade after decade, leads to deterioration of the brain in later life. There is roughly a 20% prevalence of significant dementia at the age of 80, a 40% prevalence at 85, 60% at 90, 80% at 95, and fairly universal at 100. In an era when people very rarely lived into their 80s and 90s, it was not a particular issue for society, but we have changed. We now have a fairly equal opportunity, ability to live in good health into 80s and 90s. And so it has become much more of a challenge for us to deal with. We are very, very good at making people with dementia invisible because nothing really shows. And because that's a mirror we don't want to look into. We are all culturally scared to death of dementia because dementia is the disease that destroys self. And we have no more fundamental concept in Western societies than the idea of self, that I am unique, an individual, and I am different from you. And the disease that removes and erases that is to be feared above all others. So if they don't look sick and we don't have to look at them, we can put them places or we can create lives for them where we don't have to see them. We are, always arguing in this country about health priorities and where does the money, should it go? Dementia hits people who are past functional life in general. So they don't have a huge lobby pushing for better treatment. Next slide. We've been pretty good about eliminating most diseases that kill people young. So most people will live to older age. Let's say we could get rid of dementia and that Alzheimer's disease, that there was a cure, a magic pill came out. 
everybody is still going to die. So what would they die from instead? There is some evidence that dementia is a lifelong process. And this comes from uh, work done uh, in Minnesota called the Nuns Study. Now, I, the big problem with trying to understand dementia is how do you sort out what is due to the actual brain process from what is due to a life lived as an individual with all of its unique exposures and choices in order to be able to figure that out, you have to find people that have lived identical lives with identical exposures. And someone hit on the brilliant idea of using cloistered nuns. And there is a order of cloistered nuns that work as librarians called the Sisters of Scholastica. And they are based in Minnesota. And I did not know that Minnesota was a hotbed of Roman Catholicism, but apparently that's where they are. And a deal was struck with them a number of decades ago that as they aged and died, that their brains could be studied to see who became demented and who did not. And something really fascinating turned up that the nuns who were demented late in life, if they went back 70 years to when they entered the novitiate and looked at their personal essays from that time and at how they used language, those women who used simpler language were much more likely to become demented as older women than women who used more complex language as young women. So you could detect the chance of dementia in women in their 20s by doing this kind of linguistic analysis. Does this mean that dementia sets in in the 20s? We don't know. It may mean that we're not, just not all built the same and some of us are gonna ski down the slope and cross the finish line before others. Who knows? Interesting things to think about. Next slide, please. Dementia is more than confusion. You know, there's lots of things that can interfere with mem memory, you know. We all have that day where we come home and we look at our family and we say, if any of you says one more word, and we go into our bedrooms and we slam the door and we put the pillow over our head because our brain is just on overload. That is not dementia. That is just a brain that has been asked to do too much information sorting too fast. Medications can cause signs and symptoms of dementia. The one that's common that we see all the time is diphenhydramine or Benadryl, which is the active ingredient in pretty much everything you could buy over the counter for sleep that's not melatonin. And all of those medications can cause signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's in older brains. And that includes things like Tylenol PM. And <clears throat> there is even some evidence that if you take enough of it as a, an adult, that you can actually cause Alzheimer's to happen earlier. Um, acute illness or disease will cause physiologic upset, which can affect the brain. And uh, some sort of disorientation. I mean, we all have that issue or have had that experience where we've been out of town, we've woken up in a strange hotel room or something, and we have that moment of, wait, what's going on? Where am I? Next slide. So, dementia, what is it? memory impairment, loss of language and being able to express oneself, loss of the ability to understand what other people are trying to say uh, in expressing themselves. Next. Eventually, loss of purposeful movement. They have the physical ability to do things, but they can't actually perform the task as they can't sequence all of the physical movements needed to be able to perform it. This is why people have difficulties handling showers, putting clothes on, things of this kind. They can't appropriately interpret sensory information properly, and they may misinterpret in hallucinosis, such as seeing or hearing things that are not there may come there. Next, 
They can't think properly. They cannot what, do what we call abstract. That is carry a idea out of its concrete physical form and apply it to some other situation. They can't reason, reason their judgment is seriously impaired and uh, personality may change in some way, shape or form next. And all of this added together lead to changes in behavior, emotional state, personality, and we have families going, they are no longer themselves. And they're quite right, they are not. The person inhabiting the body that they are conceiving of as being one person has metamorphosed into a different person altogether. Next. We talked a little bit about some of the kinds of dementing illnesses to watch out for. And here are a few others, most of which are not as common. Next. In terms of determining you know, what's going on, um, we often use what's known as the FAST scale to determine. It is a seven stage scale that's used in clinical practice to kind of allow us to know where somebody is on their dementia journey. Next. We're all in stage one. That's normal, where everything works, the memory is the way it's supposed to be. All young adults, unless they've had something weird going on, are in stage one of dementia. Next. After page, age 50, most people start entering stage two, and I am definitely there. And these are kind of normal age-related changes of one kind or another, and these are things like I can't remember the right word for something. There's just a blank when I try to come up with it. You know, honey, bring me the thing. It's sitting over there on, on the thing. Uh, not being able to remember somebody's name, someone you've known for 40 years and you saw them yesterday. Walking into the next room going, why did I come in here? Putting things down and having no idea where you put them and then wondering why you put it in the refrigerator. That's all perfectly normal, and we do not consider this actually dementia of any kind. Next. Mild cognitive decline, stage three. This is where people lose the ability to multitask. If it is an early onset dementia and someone who is still employed, it usually shows up at work because most jobs require people to multitask and think of lots of different things and do lots of different activities fairly simultaneously, and people have difficulties with doing that. They don't remember what they've read. They can't remember the names of new people. They can't plan. Uh, the word finding becomes worse. Uh, they have issues with uh, being able to switch from task to task to task. They can't put all of the steps needed to complete a task in the correct order. Next. Stage four is gets starts to get noticed at home usually. And this is the starting to lose the ability to sequence things that are kind of normal tasks that we have all done forever. And where these will show up, for instance, is a woman who has always been the cook for the family starts having difficulties making recipes that she has made for years and years and years. And the family will notice that things don't taste right because she's leaving out ingredients or uh, she's leaving things in the oven too long or setting the temperature incorrectly. Or the guy that's always worked in the wood, in the wood shop and turned out beautiful things is no longer quite capable of doing that because he can't put sequence everything together properly. They tend to get more lost in uh, telling personal stories, things like that. They get uh, lost in terms of orientation in strange environments. If they're traveling, if they're in a strange city, they may completely get turned around and have no idea how to get back to the hotel. They generally won't get lost in the neighborhood, but if they're going to find someplace unusual in the car, they may miss the freeway exit or something and it won't register and they'll just keep going on 
and you read these stories about, you know, a little old lady found in the middle of Tennessee in the car, the gas ran out because she just kept going and going and going. Next. Stage five, uh, this is where we start to say that people are actually having dementia. And this is what we usually call early dementia. And everybody notices that this person is not thinking correctly. They have difficulty remembering things that should be fairly automatic, like uh, their address or their phone number. They, have, they can't do things like make change. Uh, they get confused about the date. Uh, they show up at appointments at the wrong day or the wrong time. Uh, but they are pretty intact with their ability to do their basic activities of daily living. They have no problem recognizing familiar environments, familiar people. And their sense of autonomy and their sense of stealth is usually very intact, and so they have very little insight into their deficits, and they cannot understand that things are not working right. They think that they're fine, the rest of the world gone crazy. Next. Stage six, people are starting to have difficulties with their basic activities of daily living because they can't sequence things they have difficulty getting ready for the day because they can't figure out the order in which the clothes must go on or how to do all of the tasks in the bathroom to get ready for the day. They don't remember uh, what happened a moment ago in another room. They will start to forget the names of people that they see routinely, even though they usually recognize them as being someone that they know is important to them. Their sleep cycles go all over the map. They can become delusional. They become paranoid. Uh, they, at this point, their brain knows something is seriously wrong, but still has difficulties in understanding what that may be and still tries to cover for it. Next. And lastly, in stage seven, people have lost their ability to care for self completely. They usually require assistance with uh, being able to walk or uh, get in and out of a chair or in and out of bed. They usually will require some sort of sitting with them to be able to eat properly because they may get very distracted between bites or they may not quite understand how to use their utensils. Uh, they lose their continence because they don't understand their own body signals in regards to bowel and bladder and they cannot speak with any kind of uh, regularity, and they may not recognize even the most familiar people. Next. So moving on into competency and capacity. Competency is a legal term, and it's defined in state law. When in the state of Alabama, you hit your 19th birthday, you are considered a legal, emancipated, and competent adult. And you are allowed to make your own choices, whether they're good choices or not so good choices. The law says nothing about that. You are competent under law until the law says you are not competent in some way, shape, or form. Next. Because it's a legal term, in order for someone to be declared incompetent, it is the legal system that must do this. It is not something that is done within the healthcare system. It's a legal proceeding. It usually involves probate court and a judge that passes a decision as to whether this person is competent or not competent. It usually ends up if the judge feels that they are not competent with a legal state, either a conservatorship, which is usually a, uh, a entity of some sort that takes over in terms of finances, estate, and decision making on the uh, where, where somebody will live and how it will be paid for, or a guardianship where basically all of your adult rights are removed and placed in someone else. It's basically as if you become a minor child again, and under a guardianship, that individual 
makes your decisions. You cannot override them in any way, shape, or form. If that individual says you will live in a nursing home, that is where you will live. If you have some sort of an intact family structure and you require guardianship or conservatorship, that will usually rest within the family. If you do not, oftentimes you will be assigned uh, to the public guardian's office, which is a portion of the Department of Human Resources and usually varies county to county in the state of Alabama. Next. If your adult rights are removed and a guardianship is established, the legal system is allowed to enforce that status. So if you are created a, uh, a guardianship of someone and you say, I do not want to live here and you leave, the police can bring you back. And you are not allowed to have a different opinion about, you can have an opinion, but you're not allowed to have different um, arrangements made. If you are made like a ward of the public system, a family member cannot swoop in and say, no, you're going to live over here. It have, everything must go through that guardianship system. Now, a family can then apply to become the guardians, but it will again take a court proceeding and a judge to change the guardianship. And if you have improved in terms of your uh, ability to kind of uh, think. Let's say your cognitive issues are not a dementing process, which is not going to improve, but due to a physiologic illness of some sort that has a chance of improvement, and it does improve, and you are doing much better a year later, it will require court proceedings to lift that guardianship and restore those individual rights. Next. What the legal system is going to want in terms of being able to uh, decide whether an individual is competent or not is evidence from the medical system about how this individual is able to function. And it will ask for things such as chart notes or test results or the results of cognitive testing. Now, if there are battles over whether someone is cognitively intact or not, and there are often battles, particularly when there are no, larger sums of money involved. Uh, if a individual has a fairly large estate and large capacity, financial capacity, there are often several branches of the family, each of which wishes to control the money in their way for their own benefit. When this happens, um, the kind of testing that is required to really understand the abilities of the individual is beyond that which most doctors and nurses are capable of doing. And it is what's known as neuropsychiatric testing. Next. Neuropsychiatric testing is not administered by physicians or by nurses. It is administered by trained neuropsychologists. If it's done for medical purposes, it is paid for by Medicare and under insurances. But if it is being done for the legal purpose of determining competency, it is not paid for. There are a lot of different kinds of neuropsychiatric testing. The kind of the usual battery that is done is a three to four hour battery of tests. Um, if there are real questions from a legal point of view, generally, when it comes to the administration of estates and money, uh, there needs to be far more than this initial battery done. And that is what is known as forensic neuropsychiatric testing. And that is testing that looks very, very specifically at cognition and reasoning around such things as finance, mathematical skills, contracting, the understanding of contracting, et cetera. And that uh, really requires a specialized uh, neuropsychologist to do and uh, quite some time. And again, not paid for under health insurance. Next. Now, the other word that we throw around a lot is capacity. And this is the one that has much more meaning in healthcare than competency does because it is not a legal state. 
capacity is the ability for an individual to be able to make an appropriate choice and understand the risks, benefits, and alternatives of that choice. And so people can have very different capacities depending on what the choice actually is. People who have a lack of financial capacity and understanding about how to spend their money or what things cost or how basic personal finance should work may be perfectly intact in terms of their capacity to understand issues of bodily autonomy, such as the, what a particular procedure or a surgery or something might need. Um, people who may have issues with finances will have understanding of living arrangements and who they wish to live with or how, what kinds of services should be put in place. And then there are the issues of legal contracting and whether it's an individual has the capacity to understand the issues involved in making a will or a property transaction such as buying or selling a house or in entering into a marriage, which is a legal state and a legal contract as far as the law is concerned. Next. So capacity is always a moving target and has to be thought about in generally in the healthcare arena by many different disciplines and input needs to come from different places to decide whether or not there is the capacity to make a particular decision. A physician or other provider in terms of medical decision-making or medication management, nursing for issues of self-care, physical therapy for mobility, occupational therapy for IDADL functions, social work for family and community support. All of these kinds of things are important in determining who has capacity and who is not. Most ethical questions that are refer to hospital ethics committees usually revolve in some way around an issue of capacity. And generally they hit the ethics committee when it is determined that the patient does not have capacity to make that decision. So the ethics committee is, is usually not dealing with whether capacity exists or not. Usually most people can figure that one out. The issue becomes if capacity does not exist, who is empowered to be the surrogate and to make the decision that must be made? And that's where most of the battles come. If you think back 10 or 15 years ago to the Terry Schiavo case, that's what the case was about. The issue was who had the legal right to make the decisions in regards to Ms. Shivo, who could not make decisions for herself? Was it the husband or was it the parents? Every court decision sided with the husband because a marriage trumps every other relationship. The Parents knew they could not win in a court of law and took it to the court of public opinion and the media. And that's where the whole media circus came from. Next. So what are some signs of diminished capacity? It would be nice if we could say, well, there's a particular test we could do that would say that this person has capacity or doesn't, but they don't exist. Um, Certain behaviors when taken together might signal it. Look at the decisional abilities, whether or not they're acting the same way they were they would have acted a year or two earlier. Try to avoid the stereotypes. Look at what other factors may be in, uh, in, <clears throat> impacting things. If someone was a recent widow or widower, 
that may change how they approach certain things. And that may not necessarily mean diminished capacity. And all of these kinds of things must be uh, kind of put into the pot when thinking about it next. The cognitive signs we look for, short-term memory loss, disorientation, problems with understanding or uh, <clears throat> implementing either written or uh, oral communication, obvious comprehension problems, loss of flexibility in, and inability to, to uh, understand that there may be alternatives, issues with being able to calculate or you know, do basic math in one's head next. Some other things, emotional ability, major emotional distress, delusions, hallucinations, inability to keep up one's own appearance all suggest that uh, capacity is not what it once was. Next. Financial capacity is the one that usually comes up first. Does this person really have the ability to understand how their money is being used or to manage their resources in an appropriate way to care for themselves? We all have made bad financial decisions in our time. We all spend money on things where we go, dang, why did I do that? This is not the issue. The issue here is money that is needed for other things for maintenance of health and life is being diverted into things that it should not be going to. Next. So again, some of the things we need to look for, confusion, judgment, mistakes, disorganization, memory lapses. Um, those of you with older parents, it is good to get into the habit once they're over 75 or so to sit down with them once a month with, after they've done the bills and just kind of look everything over and make sure it all makes sense. If they're in their 80s, getting, du getting on the accounts and getting duplicate statements is a really good idea looking for something that looks unusual or problematic. Next. Because older individuals are very subject because of the changes in cognition and capacity to undue influence. And I have a number of cases where an older individual has made a new friend or uh, hired a caregiver with unscrupulous motives. And that new friend sets about reordering the finances and the property and gets themselves on deeds and things like that uh, while the family is just unaware that any of this is going on. Next. And most investment advisors and particularly those who work for large companies are on the up and up and uh, do Fine, but there are always uh, investment advisors who go where the money is and who circle around uh, wealthier communities offering better returns or better deals that they can get with the big guys and who start rooking older people out of their money. And there have been a number of cases of fraudulent investor, investors arrest, investment professionals arrested in Mountain Brook and Vestavia and places like that over the years. Um, and on a national level, you know, the most famous one, of course, is Bernie Madoff. Next. Some of the scams that are out there that you have to watch out for in terms of diminished capacity. Fundraisers particularly fundraisers that use scare tactics. And this usually is politics or religion. Those scare tactics are all about driving more and more checks and not about any particular reality. Sweepstakes, the minute you actually send money into any sweepstakes, you'll go on the we got a sucker list and more and more and more of them will arrive in the mail. Um, there's a new one I've seen a lot recently of uh, that's targeting older people of 
your doctor is going to be mi is missing certain things about your health. And please sign up here for our genetic testing, where we can tell you about all of these wonderful things uh, that uh, your doctor has to know and may not know. And they bill thousands of dollars for completely unneeded blood tests. Uh, get rich quick investment schemes, of course. Phishing. Phishing are emails that are designed uh, to look like real and important things that are all about uh, gathering your personal information in one way, shape, or form. Um, you know, they will often look like they're coming from your bank saying, we've detected fraud on your account or something. You know, please edit your bank account number <laughs> so we can double check it. Um, friendly phone calls looking for personal information. There's a lot of people that call up, pose as, you know, fairly traditional surveys. Older people are often lonely. Anybody calls them on the phone, they're happy to talk. Um, Family member, please. Uh, we'd like to think that all of our grandkids are on the up and up, but there's often a black sheep that will be uh, starting to uh, siphon off dollars if they can figure out that they can. And there's also a really common scam that's out there of phone calls of this is the police in such and such a jurisdiction. We have your family member in custody and we, you know, to get them out of this horrible jail situation, you need to send uh, a check or a wire a transfer of dollars to us for bail. Next. In Alabama, in terms of uh, helping people avoid these things, this falls under the Department of Human Resources Adult Protective Services. If you are working in healthcare as part of the paperwork you signed for your licensure, one of the things you signed was something that states you were a mandated reporter of any kind of adult and elder abuse. Things that you are uh, supposed to report include an unsafe living condition, uh, any signs of physical or emotional abuse, any sign of exploitation of finances, or a situation where there's lack of basic necessities like food, shelter, and water. Now, Child Protective Services is empowered to basically go and remove a child right away. But because adults are considered to be competent to make bad choices, it is a much harder thing to pull somebody out of a bad situation uh, when they're an adult and they have not gone through that legal process to be declared incompetent. They are presumed to uh, be allowed to make a bad choice to remain in a bad situation. APS can pull people out against their will, but it is something that APS must determine. They get to decide who they do and who they do not. It is not something that you can force them to do one way or another. Um, in general, most of the APS reports that I or people I work with make are what we call CYA reports because we're mandated reporters and it's a situation we don't like. We report it. We know that APS is not necessarily going to do anything, but it has started a paper trail and it so when, if something bad happens in the future, we are covered to say, we knew about this, we reported it, and you know, when, and if APS did nothing, that's their problem. Next. And I think that's the end of the prepared remarks. Thank you so much. We had three people who have, uh, said how much they're getting out of this topic. And I too got a lot. And I think I've done perhaps see you along these lines, but I really didn't know it in depth like you, Dr. Duxbury. And I knew that I didn't. And I'm so glad that you shared your expertise. I don't know if anyone has questions. There's a lot of thank you. This was amazing. Great information. Great job and information. Oh, they just keep coming. I can't even keep up. <laughs> So that's excellent. And uh, I, I was going to say that I was going to add to, I walk on Thursdays with a, a woman named Barbara, who's 87. And she worked in Manhattan during the 60s as a copywriter. I always think of her as Peggy on Mad Men, if you know the show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I do. But 
So Barbara's a fascinating woman and still at 87 is learning. So she's, you know, finished taking Latin on Duolingo and now she's taking German. So she told me yesterday when we were walking that she had gotten a call and she had thought that she had, she told her kids, hey, I've got a new German pen pal. And they said, what are you talking about? She's like, this guy called me. He called me by name. He started talking about speaking German. And it was just, it was the friendly phone call, but it, I'd never heard of that. I, I said, Barbara, I wonder if they must have hacked into Duolingo's database. I mean, how else? I mean, that's a very specific scam, you know? Yeah. And, and they do. Yeah. Oh, here's a very, question. very guarded with phone calls from people you do not know and do not expect. Here's a Janice Cook says, great topic, very great topic. What can be done to help caregivers who are caring for people with diminished capacity? The biggest thing that can be done for caregivers is two things. One, they need their respite. They must be, they must have their time away. And two, they must have an individual or a group or some sort of support system that understands what it is that they do so that they could debrief. Um, in terms of other specific things, you know, to help them help that individual, that's a very complicated topic you know there's no specific you got to do this or you got to do that 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 has to be individualized with a professional of some sort you had recommended to me the 36 hour day and I that's like that the bible it. that's like the bible of caregiving right right it's right. a book called the 36 hour day it's by mace and ravens and you can get it wherever you books are sold millions of copies are out there um you know, if you come see me, yeah, we give you copies. <laughs> we order them by the case. That's where I got this. That's exactly where I got it when my mother and I visited. Uh, and, you know, her scam was was twofold. It was both a publisher's clearinghouse scam and a catfish scam um, in which she believed she would run away and spend the $3.2 million that she was paying taxes on, presumably, with Todd Sloan from Publishers Clearinghouse. So that was, yeah. it was very, very intricate. Yep, yep. There was so a question about, was, I saw a question flash past, do any supplements happen? Help do with any that? supplement, yes. Do any supplements um, help? There is no science that says that any particular supplement helps with dementia. There's a lot of things sold, but no rigorous science has been done to prove that any of these things are helpful. Most of them so, will not hurt you. They won't hurt you. So the memory uh, pill that I see advertised that's at the drugstore, I forget what it is. So, yeah, it, I don't need to take it, even though I can't remember where I, why I put the remote in the refrigerator. Yeah, well, that's basically your normal. <laughs> Here's a yeah, our pres 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 area. will not hurt. Yeah, it's made from jellyfish protein or some such thing. You know, it's basically a food a food additive. Um, but there's been no science that says that it does what it claims to do, which is why it's not sold to help any disease process. Is there a potential for a placebo? Effect? I'm sure there is. Sure. Placebo, absolutely. Uh, here's a. a comment from Ms. Fuqua, who says, in our local area, we have dementia support groups in the community. I'm certain any area on aging, agency on aging offices can connect others to more resources like this for their local areas. That's true. And also, Alzheimer's of Central Alabama has a group of, uh, I guess, they cover, they cover North Central Alabama counties. Alzheimer's of Central Alabama is a great clearinghouse. And the Alzheimer's Association has a number of chapters in Alabama, and they are also a great clearinghouse for finding things like support groups, physicians, or other organizations that are knowledgeable in dementia issues and things of that type. Right, right. And you can call them, and they'll know where the support group is near you. They're, they're often, mostly often held in churches, and I go to some churches in the area and attend these, you know, just to hope to, to be helpful. But 
I mean, I think they're, they're, they're incredibly helpful and rewarding for the people who are part of them, you know, who regularly attend. It, it really is, I think, life-saving and life-affirming for those folks. Absolutely. And when you think about it, the average uh, time spent on a weekly basis caring for someone with dementia, and I'm thinking this would be moderate to severe, is 82 hours a week. Yep. And you know, so many of you are providing that care. A week. What? There's 168 hours in a week, and a demented person can be going in any one of those. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a brilliant way of looking at it. And I've been wondering. Four, full, four full time jobs. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then to have perhaps in many cases a full time job on top of that, yeah. because particularly if it's a younger like I have right now, two clients, I mean, they're in their 60s, their mm -hmm. their spouses have dementia and it's I mean, and they were, you know, this is when they were going to travel and, yeah. you know, it's just tragic. tragic. There, are no, yeah, more there, more. Are, there are no guarantees. Right. Do you see a, a, a growing in, in terms of younger and younger people getting dementia? Well, I, d I haven't seen the numbers grow. I would say that we will see more younger people with dementia simply because um, people aren't dying of other things. Right. Well, I, I guess we've run out of questions. I just want to thank you again. You did so much yeah, work. Like it. And I appreciate it. We've learned so much from you. And I hope you, again, will be open to joining us again someday. And oh, sure. Putting together a topic and that our audience who, proposed. Yeah, and anybody who likes what I have to say and wants to know a whole lot more about my ideas on healthcare, you can buy my books. <laughs> yes, The Plague Diaries. and, and That's one the Plague Diaries. Oh, Okay. So uh, DC is the uh, capital D and capital C is the password for, and it's just the acronym for diminished capacity. So DC, capital D, capital C is today's password. Thank you again, Dr. Duxbury. If, if no one has any questions. Oh, Mr. Siggers is asking the name of your book, Dr. Duxbury. Yeah, the Accidental Plague Diaries, volume one and volume two are out. It can be bought wherever you buy books and volume three will be out later this fall. No way, congratulations. The code word for the evaluation, Ms. Fannin, is DC, both capital, uh, the acronym for diminished capacity. All right, and I'm gonna pop off. All right. Okay, Thank everybody. you so much. And I'll end this for the rest of us as well. Appreciate y'all being here today. Please join us Monday when Bill Nolan with Alabama Elder Law or Elder Law of Alabama, rather, will share with us simple estate planning. That's Monday. Please go to my website to register. I've also included a link in the response to this. Y'all look for an email from me tomorrow uh, with your certificate. And again, nurses will be posting your certificates uh, within the week. Y'all have a great